Matthew 22, as we go back to our verse-by-verse -verse study in, um, in Matthew's gospel, and the context that we're in is, is Jesus there in the temple. Uh, he's, he's ridden into the city on what we refer to as sometimes as, uh, as Palm Sunday, and, um, and has departed from the city, although he was uh, declared by the people to be the Messiah, the fulfillment of a Jewish feast. In the ful in fulfillment of uh, Zechariah 9, 9, specifically riding into the city on the uh, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, and uh, has a little a bit of a confrontation with the uh, uh, the Jewish leadership at that point, uh, but then departs. Then uh, the next day uh, comes into the city. We looked at him cursing the fig tree and what that that implied, and uh, and then. Uh, that we really won't wear fruit in our lives like that fig tree unless we pray without doubting and, uh, and so forth. He's then launched into a, a series of, of parables that are meant to basically confront this uh, uh, corrupt Jewish leadership that we know now historically, uh, archaeology, uh, archaeologically that some of them were not even Jewish that were running things in the in the temple at that point. Uh, in the midst of that confrontation, we get to the the third of, of a sense of a, a trilogy of, of parables. And what's different about this one, the other parables, uh, Jesus uh, basically tells a parable that they already know. You've heard it said, but I say. And then he said, tells a parable. And then at the end, he asks some question about, and what do you think about that? And then they say it, and then he goes, Gotcha. <laughs> that's what you're doing wrong. That's, that's what's wrong here uh, with you and what's going on. Uh, it's different in this parable because he just tells them straight out at the beginning. This is you guys. This is like the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God that you're supposed to be part of. And so everybody knows right from the outset he's talking about uh, them and they're, they're quite aware of it. And it has to do with a parable of a king having a, a, a banquet. The banquet is for his son's wedding feast, and he has sent out uh, in, invitations. And there's going to be quite a contrast between what that would be like in terms of accepting it versus uh, rejecting it. We had a family in the church uh, several years ago. They're on the, the big island now, the, uh, the Redicops, that received quite an invitation. It was an invitation to have dinner at the White House with President Bush. It wasn't them alone. It would be with the leaders, basically, of uh, evangelical Christians around the world. Ravi Zacharias would be there. Chuck Colson would be there. Chuck Swindoll would be You name it, they would be there. The head of major ministries, major churches, well-known authors, and they would have the opportunity. <laughs> Fortunately... The, the way this came about, there was another brother from Calvary Honolulu that was working at Focus on the Family. That year, uh, Shirley Dobson was the head of the uh, National Day of Prayer. And that's what this whole thing was about there at the White House to kick off the National Day of Prayer. She says to our friend from Calvary Honolulu, do you know any businessmen from Hawaii that would like to attend this function? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, he calls the Redikoffs and say, expect an invitation from the White House. It's not going to be a hoax. It's not going to be a joke. I mean, if you got a letter uh, in the mail, one of those with an envelope inside an envelope inside an envelope, you know, those kind, and uh, you finally get down to the invitation and it says it's from President Bush of the White House, would you assume it was a joke? I would assume it was a joke. So uh, he needed some notification. And, and the point of all this is that when he knew it was the real deal and it was really from, from the White House, do you think they were a little bit excited to respond and, and go? Yeah, absolutely. I'd be, I think most people would be thrilled to, uh, for something like that. And they did. And, uh, and then they came back uh, the week after and gave us a little report at church of what that was like and everything. It was, it was great. I, I felt honored just that <laughs> we got to hear about it later uh, firsthand from somebody that was there. Well, in this parable, this, uh, again, third in this trilogy, uh, we're going to hear the fact that there's a, there's a greater banquet. It's the king, the king of the whole region. It's his son, his very important son. He's getting married. And in that day, weddings were very, uh, very important, a very, very festive time. Even if you didn't have a lot of resources, your wedding would go for a week. It would be a week of several events and 
And uh, that first dinner, that first banquet uh, would kind of kick the whole thing off. And uh, even more so when it's, I mean, it's going to be a lot of grandeur to be in the palace and the entertainment, all of the food and so forth, uh, a tremendous opportunity in the parable. Let's look at the first four verses. Uh, Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding uh, banquet. So again, here we first notice the king prepared a wedding feast and now anticipated uh, a response. And as I said, very big thing in, in, in the Middle East, even as it is today. And uh, the, the point here is uh, the idea that to the listeners so far, as they're hearing what Jesus is saying, he's saying the kingdom of heaven is like this. And what it's like is something that would be a, a once in a lifetime opportunity, maybe to be offered the opportunity to go to the palace to go to a banquet uh, uh, like this. And it certainly had to stir their hearts and their imaginations, maybe a little bit, even as it did the Radikovs, the idea of going to the, uh, the White House there with, uh, with uh, President Bush. And, and what he's presenting is going to be a, a contrast of why they reject this invitation, which uh, would seem uh, incomprehensible. The second thing, the king's servants went out to tell, notice it's invited guests to come to the banquet. They've already been invited. They've already been told. Uh, King's having a banquet. They've already gotten the phone call in a sense. They've already gotten the invitation in the mail, knowing that's the real deal. Uh, and there should, should have been an anticipation that now, as soon as the king says, and today is the day of the banquet, all right, now, now we're going. We wouldn't, wouldn't miss this uh, for the world. So they already know about it. They are the invited guest. Now the time for the banquet has, has come. And the third thing about the uh, invitation going out of the king's servants went to tell the guest apparently a, a, a second time. Uh, few uh, monarchs in that era were known for their humility. <laughs> Not too many kings would, would bestow this great honor of coming to their son's wedding on someone and have them not respond and have them go, that's okay, ask them a second time. <laughs> that, that normally wouldn't happen. In fact, he might be a little ticked off that, that they, they didn't come. But not this king. This king says, tell those who have been invited, behold, I prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatted livestock are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. So again, all of this is, is supposed to help us understand God's grace and God's mercy. He is the king. They all know that. They understand that. When Jesus says, this is like the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, uh, they know who the king represents. So there's an anticipation of a response. But secondly, the king's invitation is rejected by the invited guests. And we see that in verses 5 to 7. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his field. So he's a farmer. Another to his business. Uh, the rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and, and burned the city. These guys are tracking along pretty well here at this point, would realize that they are the invited guest. Israel, the leaders of Israel that are standing before Jesus, then the chief priests and all the elders and I would say not a few Pharisees and Sadducees standing around as well, as well as the common people. Again, there's two to three million people in the city. It's Passover uh, in the temple area. The temple court area would be standing room only. It would be jammed with people to hear what Jesus had to say and see him do the miracles that he was doing. And they find out here in the parable, again, that they are the ones some have rejected because they were indifferent. Notice they went on their way, doing things they normally would have done. They're looking after their own interest. One's a farmer, one's a businessman. Apparently so preoccupied with their personal concerns for profit, uh, they, even though there's a repeated calling to come, uh, they refuse to come. And again, the contrast is, uh, is meant to be seen here. You could come to the king's palace. You're invited. It's going to be incredible. The food, unimaginable. Gourmet all the way. 
incredible uh, uh, entertainment. What an opportunity you have. You're invited to come. Oh, no, you know, I'd rather go out and stand behind my ox, you know, and eat dirt all day plowing a few more, more furrows here, you know. It's like, that's really what's on my heart. That's what's on my mind. You know, I, I'd love to come, but I'm a little preoccupied here. So the person that rejects the invitation of the king, the person that rejects the gospel, as we're presenting the gospel to people, it's like, if we know the Lord, we know the grandeur that awaits for us, which is nothing. You know, this is pale compared to what we will receive in heaven for all eternity. How can people turn away and be indifferent? How can they say, well, you know, I've got time for that later. You know, my business, I got to cut another deal here or something. You know, I haven't, you know, I haven't worked hard enough so far. Uh, these other things are preoccupying my mind. It's meant to be a contrast. Uh, and, uh, and, and certainly what's offered us in terms of the invitation, and that's the point as we'll get to the Great Commission here in a moment, is meant to help us understand what we're missing when we don't receive the invitation, what those around us are, are missing as well, and why. Sometimes it's just indifferent. They're so preoccupied with this life. We're going to talk a bit more about that in a moment. We noticed that others rejected and were violent. And uh, here they seize the king's slaves, they mistreat them, they kill them. Uh, and then the application that they would have understand, uh, the third thing, those that rejected were, were of Israel. And um, the king is obviously God, the invited guest, obviously his chosen people, Israel, that he's been calling and calling and calling, beginning with Abraham and the calling of Abraham, uh, continuing on into uh, their captivity in Egypt and his miraculous provision for them. Uh, but, but they're not coming, they're not receiving. The prophets go time and time again as they are, uh, continue to turn away from the Lord. Hosea 11 one says this, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I, I called my son. There's another place in, in, Isaiah, in Hosea 13 that, that, that he says, he talks about the fact that he says, I, I cared for them in the desert, uh, in the land of the burning heat. When I fed them, they were satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud. Then they forgot me. Uh, God's heart for his people, provision, miracles, constantly calling, constantly the invitation going out to have a relationship uh, with him. And yet that invitation being rejected. Uh, Ezekiel 16, uh, verse 4 to 14, you can read it later, but very graphic there. The prophet pictures uh, Israel as a nation, as an unborn, uh, as a born child, a newly born child that has been cast aside into an open field. And there it lies in its blood, the umbilical cord still attached. That's the picture. God comes in as the person then that, that, uh, that takes care of that baby and cleanses the baby and anoints the baby and clothes the baby and watches it grow and adorns it with jewelry. That's the picture of what God's done for his, his people, Israel. Uh, it's interesting also, according to the, the Talmud and other, other writing, it was assumed that when the, when the Messiah finally came, there would be a great banquet in his honor. And so... Jesus playing upon that with this, uh, this illustration of the wedding banquet. Uh, the, the servants continued to call, like John the Baptist that Jesus has just made reference to. Uh, you've rejected John. In a sense, when you rejected him, you've, you've rejected me. Uh, it continues certainly with Jesus and his rejection. But remember, again, this rejection is from the, uh, the national leadership there uh, in is Israel that was very corrupt. Uh, the rejection continues with the apostles, the prophets, and, uh, and those that we see in the book of Acts. God is like the king. He's gracious. He has an incredible banquet. He's prepared. He's honored them. And he calls and he calls and he calls and he calls and he calls. And he gets rejection, rejection, rejection. Some are preoccupied. <laughs> they, they, they'd rather go plow with their ox as though that were a more important thing. Some would rather cut another business deal and just go on with their lives compared to what was uh, offered to them. But again, 
Uh, Jesus kind of covered this when he talked about the parable of the sower and the seed. Remember in that there were different types of soil that represents people's hearts. The invitation is going out. It's the gospel. Why don't people receive the gospel? Why do they reject the gospel? Why do some receive the gospel and produce a crop a hundredfold? And Jesus explains that back in chapter 13. Again, one of those types of soil relating to the rejection that he mentions here. Th those that reject were like he said, seed that goes in and it seems to sprout up initially. But he says there's thorns uh, and there's weeds that crowd it out and choke it out. And then when he explains that, he says it's the worries and the cares of this life. It makes people indifferent, keeps them from going on with, uh, with, with the Lord. And, uh, and there's a couple of concerns here. And certainly we should understand that there's certainly a, a pull on people's hearts and mind to this world and the things of this world and, and not for the things of God. Why were they indifferent? Because of, in a sense, materialism, because of their career, what they wanted to accomplish for themselves personally, it keeps them from receiving the invitation. Jesus says it's the worries, it's the cares of this world. <clears throat> John, the apostle John writing in 1 John 2.15 says, do not love the world or anything in the world. You know why he said that? Because we do. <laughs> That's why <laughs> when, it, when the Bible says do not, and in this case it means stop doing that. <laughs> stop loving the world and the things that are in the, in the world. Apparently that's our natural tendency. Uh, it's our natural tendency because uh, of the world system that we live in. Uh, it's our natural tendency certainly in our own culture because we place personal uh, integrity, if you might say, uh, I'll write up there our personal status with material wealth. Uh, we even do that in, in the church sometimes. Hey, we're going to have somebody share their testimony. He's the, uh, the janitor over at Lanikai Elementary School. That, it's usually not that. It's usually some rock star, right? Or some guy that's a, a successful attorney or the head of a corporation. If we're going to get him up and share his, uh, uh, his testimony. The guy may have only been two months old in the Lord, but we're going to pick what we think, what we think, this world sees, because we have a tendency to see it that world, as important, successful. That's wrong. What's our problem? We love the world too much. John says, stop doing that. Uh, Jesus says people don't come to faith in Christ as a result uh, of it. There's two things that are uh, obvious to me here. One is there's a direct application is that uh, it keeps people from receiving Christ. And the second, the indirect application is that keeps Christians from, from growing in Christ. And, and, and Paul's very concerned about this when he's writing uh, his young protege, Timothy, in 1 Timothy 6.6. Uh, 6. He says there, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of, of evil. So apparently people can miss out on the gospel, not receive the invitation. It was true in Jesus' day in terms of uh, the Jews there in Israel. Uh, it's true in our day as well. People love this world. <laughs> add to it our, our sinful nature. Uh, add to it the, the status that our own culture places on it. Add to that also, we have a whole industry that keeps us from being content. The whole thing is meant to make us discontent. What is that industry? We call it advertising. There's no advertising that comes on and says, probably don't need our product. You're probably content without it. Probably can do without it. Hey, but if you ever, you know, sometime in the future, decide you need this kind of car, this kind of product, this kind of clinch, then hey, look us up, but you're probably okay without us. They don't really go like that, do they? They, they pretty much were bombarded constantly with advertisements that says, your life is discontent and you won't be happy unless you have this. Uh, so we've, we've got a lot of things working against us, even as believers, that can make us so caught up in the cares and the worries of this life, we don't have contentment. We don't enjoy the contentment that God wants us. It keeps people out of the kingdom of God. It keeps us as believers from maturity uh, in Christ as well. Again, the, low, the uh, call of the day is there's no personal significance without material gain. But listen to what Paul says. Now, he just said that uh, godliness with contentment is great gain. And then he addresses the subject as he's writing to the church there in Philippi. In chapter 4, verse 11, he says this, 
I've learned to be content whatever the advertising says. Now, I just want to make sure you're still with me here. I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any, in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry or all the power goes out. <laughs> Or living in plenty or in what? Whatever the circumstances, I think the Apostle Paul the other day, when the lights went out, would have just been fine with, with that, according to what he's saying here. And what he does here is very interesting, this word contentment. He takes a word in the Greek that is very familiar to the Stoic philosophers uh, that basically says contentment is self-sufficiency. He says, I understand what the Stoics are saying in terms of a self-sufficiency. In our day, it would be the, the New Ager, certainly. The New Agers would say, you can learn to be self-sufficient. You can learn to be content by looking in and inward uh, and not outward to, uh, uh, to a God that might be there. You can learn to be content in terms of self-sufficiency. Certainly, there's a lot of motivational speakers that... that, that uh, come into the business world that teach this concept of self-sufficiency. And after all, we like it because we're Americans. We want to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, just the way John Wayne did. Uh, our culture buys into this whole self-sufficiency. It was big in, in Paul's day, so he takes their term and he stands it on its head. Uh, and he says, I've learned the real secret of contentment. And he, and he tells us, uh, what it is, down in verse 13, as he continues, he says, uh, not self-sufficiency, it's a Christ sufficiency. You know it. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. How are we content? Well, it's not going to be focusing upon materialism, things of this world, and the things of this life. Not only does it prevent people from coming to faith in Christ, it prevents us as believers from growing up in Jesus Christ. There's a pull that's there. John says, stop loving this world because we have a natural tendency to it. We've got advertising that wants to make us be content. And Paul says, but I know the secret of being content, and it's not self-sufficiency. It's believing that I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Therefore, I can be content. He says, I know what it is to have plenty to eat, and I know what it is to be hungry, and I can be content in any of those circumstances. Uh, and I, I think there's another, there's another part of the, the equation here, and that is Paul could do all those things because he realized his time here on earth, no matter what it was like, whether he was shipwrecked in an ocean, hanging onto a plank, trying to be the first surfer, or, or if he was actually in a dungeon somewhere, he knew it was just for a time. He knew it was just for a period of time. He knew that he would be in heaven at the king's banquet for all eternity. Compared to plowing out in the field, what he was giving up was nothing compared to if he kept his eyes, in a sense, on the prize. You know, when, uh, when our kids were, were, uh, were much younger, they uh, loved to go camping, and uh, we would even uh, not only do the, the summertime trips to Bellows and different places that uh, some of you guys have camped, but um, uh, we would even go just up the street from our house to Ho'omalahia and even camp over, overnight there. It's like we could almost walk there, but we, you know, uh, still it was a beautiful place to camp. And as long as you can have a fire and make s'mores, you know, we're, that was a success. You know, when you're a five-year-old, that's a successful camping trip, you know, uh, to say nothing about being able to go, you know, uh, drown a hook in the lake there and actually uh, catch something. Of course, you've got to throw it back, but still it fulfills the required fishing, uh, you know, that uh, you're looking for in a camping trip. And uh, we had some great, great times up there. But of course, when the kids were younger, they always hated the, you know, the camping trip was over, taking the tent down. We'd actually leave the tent up. You know, you got to pack up, you got to get ready to go. All that takes a while. We'd actually leave the tent up with nothing in it as long as we could, because the kids, when they, as long as the tent was there, we're good. But when that tent came down, ah, uh, you know, now the, the trip is all over. But for the sake of an illustration, if we were able to say to them, if they were five or six or seven or eight or nine, you know, our camping trip is ending now. We're about ready to take the trip. But you need to know this. As soon as we pack everything up, we're going home. We're grabbing our bags. We're headed to the Honolulu International Airport where we're going to board a plane. We're flying to LAX and we're going to Disneyland. Ah! Now see, uh, camping, ending the camping trip is okay because what we're going to next is far greater. And Paul says the same thing. He says, this life compared to heaven is nothing. 
And, and the idea that things aren't going well right now, I'm struggling a little bit. He says, I can be content with that. I can live with that. I can understand that I'm not going to love this world. I'm not going to let it prevent me from sharing the gospel with someone else, receiving the gospel myself, or growing up in Jesus Christ. I can learn to be content in every, uh, in any situation. And Jesus here uh, describes this second group of people that way who did not receive uh, the invitation. The second group he talks about here are, he says, some rejected who were actively host hostile to the gospel. In verse 6, the rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. And um, it is interesting that uh, persecution of Christians around the world and historically has been not 100% not of the time, but primarily from, uh, from other false religious systems. I would include atheism as a false religious uh, system uh, as well. Uh, but, and that's what we see uh, in the world today. We've talked about what's going on in Orissa in northern India. I was just reading uh, another uh, kind of follow-up with that. I, I saw some uh, email photographs that sent to me that would kind of break your heart of, uh, you know, people that have had their, their, uh, their arms or their legs uh, macheted, you know, cut off in the persecution. There's been, you know, hundreds of people that have died, uh, uh, dozens and dozens of, uh, of churches, some of them uh, uh, Gospel for Asia, believer churches, and a sense Calvary chapels that have been burnt to the ground in that area. There are over at least 50,000 Christians that are running for their lives uh, in northern India today. Some of them made it to make shift ref refugee camps. Others have it. They're hiding in the forest. They're hiding in the jungles, hoping they will not be found. If they will, they will be, they will be killed uh, and, and many of them tortured before they're killed. Who's doing this? Hindus. Hey, I thought the Hindu guys were like the nonviolent, you know, kind of a Mahatma Gandhi thing. No, actually, he tried to impose that upon Hinduism, borrowing from his childhood religion of Jainism, but it never really went over. I mean, uh, in his left lifetime, there was a little bit of the nonviolent thing, but uh, by and large, the Hindus are, are violent. And they've been persecuting against the Muslims, fighting with them for a number of years. When we were traveling in northern India, that's, that's really the concern, is that uh, I hope the, the Muslims or the Hindus don't blow up the railroad tracks today trying to get each other, and we happen to be on the train. That's, that's one of the, uh, the concerns there. False religious systems, by and large, have a tendency to be violent and persecute Christians. And certainly... As we fight the war on terror, that's what we're fighting in a sense. We're fighting, you know, again, religious fanatics that are persecuting those that are not of their faith. So again, some people reject and they're just indifferent to the invitation, God's invitation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Others, they're just flat out uh, hostile to it. Uh, we see that in the illustration here. Uh, and certainly it continues today. But what's highlighted here is God's patience and God's graciousness. It's not like, it's not like that happened once and the king went, that's it, you know. Uh, no more invitations. This is all. It doesn't happen. That happens. What does he do? He sends another servant. He sends another servant. He sends another servant. He sends another servant. All the way from Abraham through the prophets, all the way to John the Baptist, to Jesus, and continues through the book of Acts, through the preaching of Peter and Paul and, uh, and so many others. So that's what's highlighted here. What this thing is all about is about the king and about his son and their gracious invitation. But there's a limit. Third thing is that we see that all who rejected were punished. The king sends his army. He destroys the murderers. He burns the city. Uh, as in the parable of the vineyard that Jesus has just told, God's patient, uh, but his patience has, has a, a limit. So after repeated invitations and uh, repeated wicked responses, the king finally becomes enraged. And, that, and that's exactly what happened. And uh, it was no mystery to them at this point as they're listening. Jesus is saying to them, you are the ones that have rejected the prophets. You've rejected John the Baptist. You're rejected me. And one day this city will be leveled because God the king in heaven will send an army against the city and everyone here will be destroyed. They understand. I mean, we, we know that happened historically, but they're, they're understanding, obviously, the implications of what Jesus is saying. I'm sure they're not real thrilled about it. And what may have come to mind, what probably came to mind, 
uh, was a prophecy by Moses uh, all the way back to Deuteronomy 28. Now, I want to read that to you and keep in mind, we understand Titus and the Roman legion move, moving into the city. Uh, also keep in mind that, that uh, most Pharisees at that time, let me take that back. I don't know that most, but we know that some Pharisees at that point had memorized the entire Torah. So if they were familiar with anything in Scripture, it's this. It's the writings of, of Moses uh, in particular. And uh, I have to believe that this passage may have come to mind as Jesus is telling the parable. Deuteronomy 28, 49, a warning by Moses. Uh, again, if the people can reject God and God's authority. Verse 49, the Lord will bring a nation against you uh, from far away, from the ends of the earth like an eagle sweeping down. And I don't have to tell you that kind of the, the primary logo of the Roman Empire was that of, uh, uh, of an eagle. A nation whose language you will not understand. A fierce look, looking nation without respect for the old or pity for the young. That, that, that's exactly what happened. They will devour the young of your livestock and the crops of your land until you are destroyed. They will leave you no grain, new wine, or oil nor any calves of your herds or lambs of your flocks until you are ruined. They will lay, lay siege to all the cities throughout the land until the high fortified walls in which you trust fall down. They will besiege all of the cities throughout the land the Lord your God has given you. Because of the suffering that your enemy will inflict on you during the siege, you will eat the fruit of the womb, the flesh of the sons and daughters the Lord your God has given you, and, and that all these things happened. That happened as well. Even the most gentle and sensitive man among you will have no compassion on his own brother or the wife he loves or his surviving children. And it goes on and on and on. 1,500 years before the event happens, Moses predicts what Jesus is talking about here uh, in this parable. And of course, Titus and the Roman legions did move in in 70 AD. They kill 1.1 million. They continue throughout the land of Israel, pretty much uh, uh, annihilating uh, anybody else that they could find. And, uh, and, and we're all probably familiar with what happened in Masada, where uh, those that were living up there stayed up there uh, and were able to hold off the Roman legions for quite a while. But after they built their siege ramp, which uh, the, re the, the remains are still there leading up to Masada, rather than be captured uh, by the Romans, uh, they committed uh, mass suicide. Uh, but just a tragic time in the, in the history of uh, is Israel, and we've mentioned on occasion before that because of Jesus' extended prophecy on this in Matthew 24 in the Olivet Discourse, where he says, when you, when you see uh, these armies surround the city of Jerusalem, you see them begin to build siege ramps. If you have the opportunity, get out of here, get out of town. Now, Jesus is predicting the time where the Antichrist will come and do that very thing, and there'll be an opportunity for, for Jews to flee and get to uh, present-day Jordan. Well, in uh, about 60 AD, Titus was not the first general that tried this. The one previous to this ran out of supplies in 60, about 68 uh, AD. Uh, he ends up having to go back to the uh, Mediterranean, to Caesarea, to resupply, and he's killed uh, over there. So all of the Messianic Jews... We are all Messianic believers. We, Jesus, Jesus is the Messiah. All the Messianic Jews that were in the city in 60 AD, when they saw the siege ramps coming, they go, this is what Jesus talked about. If we have the opportunity, we need to get out of here. And when the Romans pulled back for a period of time, they all fled to present day uh, 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 Pella in, uh, in Jordan. Josephus writes about it as well as a couple of other historians. As far as we know, there were not any believers in Jesus that suffered during this time. But nonetheless, it's exactly what Jesus is talking about uh, here, Titus and the Roman legions. I want to read uh, an extended quote to you from Josephus, uh, Flavius Josephus, in, uh, in his book, The Jewish War. And keep in mind that uh, he was not a Messianic believer. He was not even, in a sense, a good Jew. He was pretty much sold out to the Romans, he was a historian for them. That's why he can write about this with firsthand account, but he, he's not killed himself. Not, it would not be a popular guy uh, among the Jews uh, or the believers of that day. But uh, Josephus says this about the destruction. That building, the temple, however, God long ago had sentenced to the flames. He may be making reference to what we've just read uh, in Deuteronomy. But now in the revolution of time periods, that fateful day had arrived. 
the tenth of the month, the very day in which previously it had been burned by the king of Babylon. It was the same day exactly of the year when Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed uh, the, the previous temple and the city. One of the soldiers, neither awaiting orders nor filled with horror of so dread an undertaking, but moved by some supernatural impulse, snatched a brand from the blazing timber and hoisted up by one of his fellow soldiers, flung the fiery missile through a golden window. When the flames arose, a scream as poignant as the tragedy went up from the Jews. Now that the object which before they had guarded so closely, the temple was going to ruin. While the sanctuary was burning, neither pity for age nor respect for rank was shown. On the contrary, children and old men, laity and priests alike were massacred. The emperor ordered the city and the sanctuary to be razed to the ground except only the highest towers. What Jesus is saying is going to happen did, did happen. And it's a, it's a tragedy. Uh, and, and what he says about these people that received the invitation is that they were not worthy. And, and, the, and the description, the defining thing which made them worthy is whether they said yes or they said no. It wasn't based on their character. It wasn't based on their good works. It wasn't based on their faithfulness. It was based on their choice of whether they said yes or they said no. If they said yes to the invitation of the gospel, they were worthy. If they said no, then they, they weren't worthy. Uh, again, so at this period then, uh, in a sense, God sets aside temporarily the nation of Israel for a time period uh, and, uh, as because of this rejection. doesn't reject his people, doesn't set them aside. Uh, in fact, Paul says in Romans 11, 1, I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. <laughs> he says... Uh, God hasn't rejected. He's rejected the city. He's rejected the national leadership. The nation will not exist until we enter the uh, end times, which you haven't noticed. They exist now back in the nation in unbelief because we know that they will receive a uh, Messiah uh, at a point in time being in the nation. And so we happen to be living in those days. And Paul says, it's not that God has rejected his people Israel. If you haven't noticed, I'm kind of Jewish myself here. So it, that's, that's not what's going on, but the nation gets set aside, again, according to the prophecy and the, par, the parable of Jesus. The king prepared a wedding feast. He wanted a response, anticipated it. It was rejected. Uh, and the third thing, and I want to encourage you, two is my longest point, so we're, we're, we're going to be okay here. Three, the king will now require the invitation to be given others, verses 8 to 10. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready. But those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street and corners and invite the banquet, uh, anyone to the banquet, anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. So the invitation now goes to, uh, to others. And the idea is go invite everyone, everyone that you can find. Jesus would say the same thing in Matthew 28, go therefore and make disciples of, uh, of all nations. Now, of course, throughout the Old Testament, it is always predicted that the gospel would eventually, the kingdom of God eventually would be preached to all nations. But these guys listening to this, this had to be a shocker. You're telling me that our city is going to be destroyed. You're telling me that I'm not going to maintain my power and my position. And now you're telling me, you got the nerve to tell me that the kingdom of God is now be going to be given to the Gentiles. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a little drama, you know, uh, building here uh, to say the least. Paul quotes Hosea. The prophet in Romans 9, 24, when he says, as it says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my beloved one who is not my loved one. So Paul using, quoting uh, Hosea in a figure of speech, uh, talks about the amin, those that are, that are my people, that are uh, not my people, and how they'll, they'll come to him. The invitation would now go to those no, others, but it also would go to those who are good and those who are, are bad. Some translations would use the term evil. And uh, I think it's interesting. I think it's also uh, important. Again, the gospel would go to everyone. 
You don't have to do something to get the invitation. It, <laughs> it's to you. It doesn't matter uh, your status. It doesn't matter your spiritual journey, your spiritual search. You could be the most wicked, evil person in the world, and the gospel is still, still for you. Salvation would be by faith and by faith alone. So, uh, again, uh, the king's invitation is rejected. He would now require the invitation be given to others. And fourth thing, the king removes a man from the wedding feast, verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the king is there. Uh, he sent word out to invite everybody that's out there, and he notices a man not wearing uh, wedding clothes. And uh, we, could, we could discern just from the text alone that it's pretty obvious that uh, as the servants go out and say, the king invites you to his wedding, please, please come. The king invites you. And, and they're just, you know, gathering people left and right. Apparently they go in. Uh, and then the, the king shows up and he, he zeroes in on one guy that doesn't, is, uh, doesn't have wedding clothes on. Uh, there, there's one thing that's, uh, that's obvious. The king must have <laughs> supplied the wedding clothes. But there's one guy that, that hasn't uh, received them. And in fact, again, Arche uh, archaeological records tell us that uh, this happened. There would be kings that would want to, they want a big crowd. And so at a particular event, and so they would go out on the highways and the byways and they would just invite, invite, invite and kind of pack the thing out. And the king would supply clothing to all, all of these people. You know, you could be out running in your sweats. You know, you wouldn't want to go to the White House like that. So there's clothing that is appropriate that's provided. Uh, yet there's somebody here that has said, I'll go, but I'll go on my own terms. No, I don't want those wedding clothes. I think I'm good enough the way that I am. The gospel goes out. People could hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for their sins, and, uh, and they want to uh, be part of uh, the kingdom of God. Yes, I want to go to heaven, and, uh, and I'm going to come, but I'm coming the way I am. Uh, I don't need to humble myself. I don't need the, the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to me. I'm a good enough person on my own. In fact, I'm going to do this and this and this. I'm going to begin attending and doing this and praying this many times, whatever it might be. We can try to put on, in a sense, clothes of our own righteousness, but the warning here is the king will end up rejecting us. And notice the guy, when he's confronted, he's speechless. There's no, he doesn't have anything to say. There's no justification for his actions. But then the king removes the man not wearing the, the wedding clothes. And again, Paul talks in 2 Corinthians 7 about the fact that uh, it's godly sorrow that leads to repentance, uh, that brings repentance, that leads to salvation. Uh, and apparently this guy never, <clears throat> never had any godly sorrow. Since Cain's attempt to bring his own offering Man has been trying to attain his own relationship with God and his own means. And we talk about very often that's the difference between religion and Christianity. Religion is man's attempt to reach God. Christianity is God's attempt to reach down to man. Uh, and if we try to come to God in our own terms, on our own way, in our own righteousness, uh, in the end, we're, we're singled out by God and, and judged by God with everybody else. Uh, the Jewish leaders of, of that day would have been familiar with Isaiah's passage, Isaiah 61.10. There the, uh, the prophet says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of, of righteousness. And the book of Revelation, again, talks about uh, a heavenly scene there and worship around the throne and that the saints of God are, are clothed, again, uh, with uh, the robes of righteousness provided by God. So again, there's uh, an anticipated response. It's rejected. Uh, the invitation then is required to go to others. But even to those others, it's still they've got to come the way the king is prescribed, not of their own doing. And then fifthly, the king's invitation must be received. And we see that in verse 14. For many are invited, but few are chosen. And you could say, for everyone is invited, but few are chosen. And certainly we could take this little, 
verse and do uh, 16 weeks on the balance of God's sovereignty and, uh, and man's free will choice. But what uh, is important that we've already seen here is that the invitation, there's a general call, the invitation, the gospel is for everyone. Uh, it was for the Jews first, for the nation of Israel. It continues to be to the Jews and to the, uh, the Gentiles also were to go to all the world with the gospel, to everyone. The general call, the invitation uh, goes out. At the same time, uh, the response is not predicated upon somebody doing something first. Uh, no, the good and the evil can all respond uh, to, the, to the gospel call. Others were not found worthy based on the fact of whether they accepted or whether they rejected, and that was all. This is simply, again, the message of the gospel that we're saved by grace and grace alone. But this idea then that few were chosen, and by the way, when, when were we chosen? Well, we find out from the book of Ephesians, it was before the creation of the earth. I think that was a really long time ago. Before the foundations of the earth, uh, we, we were chosen. Well, if I hadn't done anything yet, then I guess it couldn't be based on anything that I do. No, that's right. It's, based, it's not based on you at all. It's based on God's graciousness to keep sending the invitation, keep sending the invitation, keep sending the invitation, keep making a way for us to, to come to him. Uh, and if we choose to come, we find out that we were chosen all along. Can you explain that to me again? No. <laughs> but you can read about it in Ephesians 1 and Romans 9 and, uh, and, uh, and, and a lot of uh, uh, other places. Uh, it's meant to be a comfort. When, when God talks about his election, his choosing uh, us, it's always to believers, never to unbelievers. And it's always meant to, to be a blessing. Paul says uh, in Ephesians 1 that uh, he tells us this for the glory and praise of God. You mean all along God chose me and he wanted me and I can be secure in my relationship with him? Praise God. I like to have a debate over that, though, which of these two are more important. In fact, I like to have one exclusive of the other. I think it's all man's free will choice. No, I think it's all God's election. Okay, well, you guys just step over there and enjoy yourself, but the rest of us will just be blessed by the word of God. Uh, the, which I think is the, uh, uh, is the uh, intent here, uh, is that we can enjoy both. And uh, I just find it's fascinating that there are several passages that mention both of these concepts side by side. Uh, God's sovereignty uh, in terms of salvation, man's free will choice. Uh, but once we, uh, we uh, choose, we find that we're worthy and it's worthy because of the choice, not because of anything that we've done. And then we find out that God knew all along, and God chose us all along. It's meant to be a blessing. Uh, it's meant to be a, a, a comfort. I think what we uh, take away from this is, is the idea, of, again, is the, the parable that's all about the king and his son. It's really not about the bride. She's not even mentioned. Uh, it's just about the king and his son and the invitation that continues to go out. Initially, it was a, f a formal invitation that arrived at a point in time uh, through Jesus Christ to the nation of Israel. But, uh, but uh, again, nationally as a nation, they rejected it. And now it was to go out to the highways and, and to the byways, to everyone. If we've received the invitation, then we get to be the servants uh, to go out and continue to extend that invitation to others. And maybe this is a good way of doing it. Oh, you go to church somewhere? No. Have you ever considered the claims of Jesus Christ? You know, Christ died for your sins. By the way, that's what we're singing about, celebrating about here at, here at Christmas times. Uh, you know, you, you could reject this idea that, 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 uh, that Christ died for your sins and doing so, you know what you would be like? It would be like this. In fact, Jesus talked about it. It would be like a king having a banquet in his palace. Man, it's going to be outrageous. And you get the invitation. But you say, no, I'd rather eat dirt behind my ox today. Well, that's what it's like when you don't. It's a great way of presenting the gospel. It's meant to be a contrast. Why in the world would someone not take this invitation? Why would they, would they reject it? Indifferent. And sometimes they're violent. Uh, the things that Jesus talked about that applied in his day continue in our day, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to extend that invitation. And then certainly we need to be careful the heeding of Matthew 13 and that parable, even as believers. We need to stop loving this world and get our eyes on eternity. If we do, I think we'll be extending the invitation even more to those around us.
Come down, mountains all fall to the ground, but I will fear none of these things. You shelter me, Lord, underneath your wings. The earth can shake, the sky come down, the mountains all fall to the ground. Yeah. 
just bless the Lord together. Now I praise you, Lord of all creation. You ordain the sun to rise and fall. You scatter the stars across the heaven. And you come close to nothing in the call. I want to say, oh, is your name. And our creation Oh, 